All right. Good afternoon. At least that's what it is right now when I am making this video. Um, so I'm going to do this in shorter chunks. You will see shorter chunks of lecturing um, that I will post online. Uh, hopefully this will all work out well. For now, we're going to keep it posted on YouTube, um, mostly because uh, that's how, what I know how to do, and I don't want to um, uh, reinvent the wheel for us. So let's talk about interest groups. I know we've kind of been um, out of things for a couple weeks, so we're going to use this time to sort of reorient ourselves as the last section of our conversation about the politics, the things that um, are the sort of the mid-level, the things that citizens are dealing with before we start doing the more specific um, institutions of American government that we will uh, talk about after our first exam. So there's sort of two ways for us to talk about interest groups. One way, which we're going to do first, is the idea of sort of citizen groups, right? So how, what's the role of, of interest groups? How do they form? How do citizens join them? And then the other side, the other way of looking at it, which we'll do um, in the second and third part of um, this series, um, is more the idea of like special interests, right? When you hear people talking about um, lobbying and people doing things to get their bills passed and stuff like that. And the reason we talk about it in these two different ways is that they are, um, they're overlapping, but not totally. So all interest groups lobby, but not all lobbying organizations are interest groups. And lobbying and the idea of special interest encompasses a larger um, idea or a larger concept than um, just what is happening in interest groups. And yes, you can probably hear my dog and that's probably going to just happen. Um, so let's first um, introduce interest groups. And interest groups are an organized group of individuals sharing common objectives who actively attempt to influence policymakers in all three branches of government and at all levels of government. So that, in, that definition shouldn't be a huge shock to you, right? It's a pretty basic definition about the groups um, that are working to influence government. I think the important thing to recognize here and the thing that makes them different um, from political parties is that interest groups care less about controlling government because what they're doing is they're trying to maximize policy. That's what they care about. So they'll work with anybody to get their policy passed in theory, right? So um, if we think of parties as needing to win elections and then um, to operate government and then do policy, interest groups are almost the opposite, right? They care about policy and they will work to win elections um, in order to to get there, but the goal is always the policy, not the winning of office. Um, so what kind of groups are we talking about here? Well, there's all sorts of groups that, that count as interest groups. Sort of the largest citizen interest groups are the one made up purely of citizens um, that, uh, that any individual can join. It's called the American Association of Retired Persons. You've probably heard that of them, the AARP. But and they're sort of our classic picture of um, an interest group. But those kinds of interest groups, those sort of citizen interest groups that people can join and pay dues to and that kind of stuff is actually kind of the smallest group of interest groups um, in our system. There's also things like the National Manufacturers Association. So um, a group that can, only businesses that can join and only certain kinds of businesses and they're very expensive, the, whose whole goal is to protect the rights and interests of, of manufacturers. Parent-teacher associations actually operate as interest groups. Now, they are trying to influence the, the behavior of people in the schools and sometimes things like school districts, but they are the same kinds of thing. They're an organized group of individuals sharing common objectives, tr actively trying to influence policymakers, right? So parent-teacher associations fit. So do things we think of as good government. Um, groups like Common Cause um, or envi citizen environmental groups like the Sierra Club, 
is sort of the, the classic example of this, but there are plenty of other ones like um, PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, or Earth First, or any of those kinds of groups whose, whose goal is a kind of a public policy overarching goal that has individuals that can join. But then so are things like the Chambers of Commerce. And the Chambers of Commerce operate in this sort of weird middle ground, and we'll talk a lot about um, or, or, let me say that different. We will talk about a lot of groups that fit there that are sort of in the middle that are both interest groups and something else. So chambers of commerce, if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, are usually sort of geographically oriented groups of businesses who meet together to do things, right? So lots of little towns all over the country have chambers of commerce, sort of big towns, but you just hear about them more in smaller towns. And the idea is, is that they are trying to um, improve the climate for business, small business in general, right? That's the whole idea of chambers of commerce. So in order to do that, they sometimes lobby, they sometimes operate as an interest group. And then they also operate as a professional organization, so a group that does things to help its members. Things like the American Medical Association, the American Political Science Association, um, groups like that all operate along those lines to say, well, lobbying, being an interest group, trying to actively influence policymakers is part of what they do. Um, notice we didn't, we didn't include things like unions. Unions are another one of those sort of strange hybrid organizations who lobby, but whose primary reason for being is to influence um, industrialist policy or the policy of their actual um, employers, um, but then they also do some kinds of lobbying and operating like an interest group. So you can ask yourself, okay, that's fine. That's what all these groups are. They're trying to um, influence policy, but why does that work? Well, be, it works because government, and particularly how our government is structured, has a set of very specific needs that are important um, to the reason why interest groups have, in, have impact. The biggest piece of this is the, what I call the flow of information. So think about it in these terms, right? A, a member of Congress has to make a decision about a huge number of um, issues in any given session, right? And they just cannot be an expert on everything that they have to make a decision about. We, that's just no human could be. And so, yes, they have staff, and we'll talk about that, and um, there are committees whose job it is to help them to specialize so they have more information about particular topics. But at the end of the day, who has the most information about a particular policy area? It's the people who are interested in that policy area, people who care about that policy area. And so in that sense, what interest groups can do is they can be um, important sources of information about specific policies, right? And in fact, that is what, as we'll talk about later on, that's what a lobbyist, particularly a professional lobbyist, somebody who gets hired to lobby, who isn't necessarily tied to any particular organization, right? What they offer to their clients is the reputation for good information, right? Networks, the ability to talk to different people, but the reason they can talk to those people is because they have good, solid, trustworthy information. So the other piece of this is a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit more nebulous, right? So policymakers need to feel like they are in some way working with the consent of the governed, right? And remember that lobbying and the activity of interest groups does not just cover um, elected members of Congress, right? It's also impacting decision makers in the executive branch and the agencies, and even to some degree in the courts are actually ways that people can lobby the courts. And so the idea here is that the democratic process, the openness of our system is what created this need for information, but also this opportunity for interest groups to be the conduit of that information. So why are there so many interest groups? Well, there's a couple ways to think about it. First of all, um, there are so many interest groups because of how the Constitution is written, 
like parties, interest groups are entirely extra constitutional. There's no specific role set up, but there is the, the sort of deep underlying expectation that our government operates with the, uh, under popular sovereignty, under the consent of the government. And so therefore, people have the right to make their needs known to government. And that's explicitly, or uh, that's basically what interest groups do. Uh, I call them um, influence multipliers, right? Because they're a way that, that ev either an individual or a business who has no vote, right, um, is able to make their needs known to the people who are making decisions. There's also a huge number of diverse interests, right? And one of the things we're going to talk about uh, when we talk about the formation of interest groups is the fact that um, there's something like a new technology creates the need for new representation. So, right, so it's a, 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 a an important factor in creating more interest groups. Um, there's just a lot of... of of in, or excuse me, a lot of interest to be represented. The third reason is um, a more active government over time. So really, uh, and you saw some of this in terms of the changes over time in terms of the party system, right? You could see that, but you're going to see this much more when we move on to talk about the institutions of government, particularly as we talk about changes in the presidency. And um, But more importantly, over time, the national government in particular, although the states have something to do with this, right? Remember federalism. Um, over time, they're taking on and dealing with more and more different and disparate issues, right? So as government is more active, that means there are more opportunities, more areas for people to make their needs known to government. There's more opportunity for interest groups to, to form. The last thing is a little bit um, less linked to our system and more just linked to the reality of the historical processes. Um, one of the early political scientists called these things disturbances, right? So anything large that happens that shifts the way people think about the world, think about the economy, think about their political representation is bound to change the role of interest groups and change what interest groups have power. So um, we've talked a bit about um, how things like the September 11th terrorist attacks changed things, right? So it's, that was a large disturbance, right? And it changed how people thought about what they needed in terms of security. Um, in terms of the workers who needed to be hired, right? Uh, this COVID-19 crisis is going to change the expectation of what kinds of things people think they need from their government. And so that's going to change the kinds of interest groups that there are. The thing to remember is that in most cases, old interest groups don't go away, right? They may go dormant or they may change to a different policy or they may keep working um, and it, under less of the spotlight doing what they were doing. And so what that does is it creates the spiral where there's more and more interest groups as the diversity of interests increases. So I, in order to best understand interest groups in particular, I want you to think about them in terms of what they do. Same as parties, right? Because they're extra constitutional. They don't have, there's no ideal type of an interest group. So let's think about what it is that interest groups do. Um, and so uh, the way I'd like to th the way I like to think about this is that they play six important roles in our system. And remember, they're everywhere in our system at all levels of government and all branches. So they're not just one. They're not just one part. They're sort of this sort of large. Um, uh, they're in the fabric of the system, uh, way more than even some of the other things that we've talked about. So the first role that interest groups play um, in our system is representation. Um, and you can think about that as representing their constituents. Now, that doesn't just mean that they're representing people who are members, right? So in some cases, people actually are members of these groups. But think about the Sierra Club, right? One of the first groups that was on our list. Um, the Sierra Club is an environmentalist organization. But it doesn't just represent the people who have given it money and are members, right? It represents everyone who agrees with its goals. And now Sierra Club is more 
uh, oriented toward things like conservation and national parks and things like that. Um, and so they have a set of constituents, right? A group of people who agree with their aims and who want to see those goals put forward. And so that's why we think about it as constituents. The same thing is true with the AARP. In fact, that's maybe even a better example. Because the AARP, when it goes to um, make recommendations to Congress, it represents itself as the voice of senior citizens, right? Even though not every senior citizen is a member of the AARP. But because they have they have a claim to that constituency, and so that's what they do. And so representation is the first one of their roles. Secondly, interest groups provide an avenue for citizen participation beyond voting. Now, we've talked about this before, the idea that voting is kind of a, a blunt instrument, right? The decisions are structured for us. We don't get to choose anybody to run for office. Um, so interest groups allow us to concentrate specifically on those issues or areas that we may feel the most passionate about. Now, here's the thing, though, right? Participation beyond voting is a tiny proportion of citizens in, in the United States. It's something like 1% of citizens are participate in politics beyond just voting. But um, interest groups have a way to structure that participation, right? So they're the ones who, particularly ones that are concerned about citizen activity, right? They provide like the information that you need. They provide the place for you to rally. They provide a, um, a template for an email that you need to send to a member of Congress. I'm guessing many of you are members of one or another kind of interest group. And you've probably all been asked to, you know, contact your member of Congress because this is happening, right? Well, that's participation beyond voting. And interest groups are a really good way to organize that and to make it simple for people who have other things going on in their lives besides politics to be active. So that's more as we think about interest groups roles sort of as an organization. Now let's think about interest groups roles in the policy process, right? In, in their, um, in their role in, in talking to decision makers. Uh, the first way we think about this is education. Now, yes, they are educating their constituents, right? They're getting newsletters, you're getting that kind of stuff. But really, the whole idea of the importance of information flow in a democratic system means that interest groups, in fact, one of their primary goals is to educate decision makers on the issues that they care about, right? That they want to have influence on. Um, and so they play a huge role in that. And, and there are certain interest groups who are well known for producing certain kinds of information, of knowing um, right, certain kinds of information. And so um, that's a really important role they play um, in their relationships with decision makers. And in, in relation with the system in general, interest groups care about the agenda. So remember when we talked about the media and we talked about agenda setting, right? Agenda setting in the context of media is the media saying what we ought to pay attention to. Well, agenda building works in a similar way in terms of interest groups. You could have the best policy solution for a problem, but if no one is paying attention to that problem, then nothing is going to happen. And so interest groups spend an awful lot of time just trying to get the particular issue they care about to be an important thing in the conversations and the decisions that are getting made, right? So... For example, um, there are people who are walking around with really good ideas about how to um, <clears throat> how to solve the problem that we have in terms of um, education funding, right, in the United States. But we haven't heard a lot about K through 12 education funding um, in a while at the national level, right? And so, what those groups are doing right now is not working to fix the problem, they're simply working to get people to pay attention to them, right? Because that's really what matters. One of the ways, and we don't talk a lot about policy, the creation of policy in this class, um, but one of the things that goes on in terms of making policy is that there needs to be some um, combination of a problem, a solution, and attention in order for policy to get made. And so interest groups are spending a lot of their time trying to get that attention, trying to do agenda building. Now, there are two other things that are happening that interest groups play a huge role in, but 
lots of people don't necessarily pay attention to this, and it's not super going to be super clear from how we've talked about interest groups so far. This really, these last two are really about how interest groups interact with the, with the um, executive branch. So one of the things we're going to talk about after the exam is we're going to talk about the law, right? And one of the things is that there are three kinds of law. There's legislative law, the law passed by Congress and state legislatures, but then there is also administrative law or regulatory law, which is the explanation by the executive branch how we should obey the laws, like what we, the process by which we should obey the laws. And then there's judicial law, which is the decisions and the interpretations the courts have made about those legislative laws. Um, but here's, here's the, my quick example. Think about the IRS. It's Congress who decides what the tax rate is, that we all have to file our taxes by April 15th, um, and that there are these certain things we get to have deductions for. But it is the IRS, which is an executive branch agency, tasked along with the president to execute the law, who says, here's the form you have to use, and here's the kind of proof you need for the deduction, and all this kind of stuff. Well, so that's, that's uh, regulatory law. So what provision of program alternatives and program monitoring about are about is regulatory law. And so interest groups actually play a big role in the executive branch processes of creating and enforcing regulatory law. Um, because what they have realized over time is that it's just as important to make sure that the law is getting um, enforced as getting administered in the way that we want to as it is to get the law passed in the first place and so they're providing uh, they're providing plans for how executive branch agencies might enforce a law that's the provision of program alternatives and then they pay attention to how a particular law is being enforced that's what program monitoring is and in fact many of the times when you see news articles about um, problems in an executive branch agencies, like, you know, certain things aren't happening the way they should be. Lots of times that's interest groups who draw the attention of the media to those problems. Okay, one more sort of short piece before the end of this video, and that is how do interest groups form? Well, in terms of interest groups, whether we're talking about citizen interest groups or interest groups that are made up of, of companies and organizations or professional groups, really at the core of this is a common problem or threat, right? So there's something that binds people together or something that attracts them to work together to solve a common problem or threat. But the thing is, is that we can see just from looking around us that not every problem or threat is covered by an interest group. There are plenty of groups in the United States that have a common problem or a threat that, are, that don't have adequate representation. One of those groups is college students, right? Actually, college students form a fairly large group of people who have a similar set of threats, let's say, right? So um, college students have an interest together in making sure that college is affordable, um, that education loans are, aff are affordable, and that the interest rates aren't too high. Um, all sorts of things like that. And yet there's very little sort of um, representation based on the college student identity, right? They're just, there's, there's like a national group of um, student governments I know that operates and actually does lobby on Capitol Hill. But generally speaking, you know, there's no AARP for college students. Why? Well, because it's not just about a common problem or threat. It's also about resources. Um, and I'm talking about money, absolutely, but I'm also talking about time, and in some cases, the actual issue that you're working on. So think about it. Who has more time to volunteer to do things to help protect their political interests? People who are retired. The American Association of Retired People, right? Like, that is one of the things that brings a huge amount of resources. Yes, they have money. But more importantly, they have a group of people who don't have jobs and who are old enough to have formed the habits of voting and other kinds of participation. And so that's a huge resource. For business organizations, for business interest groups, it's prim it is primarily about money. And that's how you join, is by giving um, the organization a whole lot of money. The thing is, though, there are things with problems and threats 
and resources that still don't work. So for example, let me give you the uh, story of how the American Political Science Association managed to not get a bill passed to continue our funding, the uh, funding for the political science section of the National Science Foundation. Yes, political scientists. So what was that? That was a failure of leadership on the part of our national organization who completely retooled, fired everybody, and started over after that happened. So there has to be leadership. And leadership includes not just sort of charismatic leadership, but also about people, uh, leadership who knows what they're doing. And so, in fact, there's a whole um, career path of being an interest group leader, right, of, of moving from interest group to interest group to learn how to better um, influence the people that, that you are, are working to serve, right? So that's about fundraising. That's about um, organizational building. That's about giving people information and identity. But all of these things are really important. Okay, so I'm going to end this video here. And the next video, we're going to talk about why people join citizen interest groups. Um, and then we're going to talk about um, the types of interest groups that there are. All right.